Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Heidi Swevens. I am the Director of Community Partnerships at Inclusive Arts Vermont. And I am here with uh, artist Aurora Berger and colleague Megan Bent for this artist talk. Um, for access purposes, I'm going to do a verbal description of myself and surroundings. I have blue eyes and pale skin with short brown hair. And today I am wearing a plaid flannel with um, orange and blues and maroons. Um, behind me are some blank walls. Um, and uh, that's a description of myself and surroundings. I use she, they pronouns. And I'm so excited to be part of the exhibitions team with Inclusive Arts Vermont. Uh, Mast is our current exhibition, visual arts exhibition, featuring 22 Vermont artists with disabilities. It has been traveling the state since January of 2022. Um, and it will wrap up in Montpelier at the State House in April of 2023. Currently, it's on its way to Main Street Arts and Sexton's River, and there's more information about that on our website at www.inclusiveartsvermont.org, and that's all spelled out, I-N-C-L-U-S-I-V-E-A-R-T-S-V-E-R-M-O-N-T. So enough about that. I want to introduce uh, turn it over to Aurora so that she can do an introduction um, and then we'll pass it on to Megan and get started with the conversation. Thanks so much for being here and Aurora. Um, hi, my name is Aurora Berger. Um, I use she, her pronouns and a quick visual description of myself and surroundings. Um, I am a pale woman with pink hair. I almost just said blonde uh, out of habit, but it is pink currently. Um, I have dark rectangular glasses. I'm wearing a dark purple striped shirt with some pinks and blues in it. I have a silver necklace that looks like a piece of ponderosa bark. And I am currently sitting in my classroom uh, with a very colorful neurographic mural behind me, mostly made out of reds and pinks and some blues and greens. Uh, and then off to the side are some bookshelves that are also pink. Okay, thanks. And Megan? Hi, my name is Megan Bent. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I recently joined the team at Inclusive Arts Vermont as the digital content manager. I'm excited to be joining these artist talks. A brief verbal description of myself is I am a pale woman with blue eyes and shoulder length, like brown and blondish hair. Um, I'm sitting in my apartment, which has a brick wall in the back and white walls on each side. And behind me is a blue dresser with some plants on it. Wonderful, uh, thank you. So the first thing we want to do, and we've been doing in many of these artist talks, is sharing the piece of art um, that is in the mask exhibition. And we decided on the theme mask. Um, early days of the pandemic had no idea really how it would unfold into a life of its own. With the idea of uh, many people with disabilities, invisible and visible disabilities, there's things that are hidden or shredded or people feel like they need to you know, keep um, from view or from the world. So that was the intent of the theme was wide open to artists um, to respond in whatever way um, felt like it matched their artistic expression or their time in the moment. So um, for Aurora, the piece is titled Fibrosis Covered in Tool. And um, if we're gonna go ahead and screen share that, Megan and um, Aurora will describe it and we'll go from there. Awesome. So this photograph is a self-portrait. It's in black and white. Uh, it's a photograph of me sitting on the floor cross-legged. Um, I have long blonde hair that is cascading over one shoulder. I'm clutching some tool that's sort of been um, bundled up and is very um, layered and uh, unruly looking, I guess. Um, it has lots of interesting folds and layers of translucency and transparency, um, and it is covering parts of my body. Um, you can see one of my legs. I have a birthmark on my lower leg, um, and you can see both of my arms sort of through the tool, but a large part of my body is covered 
by it. Great. And my first kind of prompt or question, Aurora, is can you tell us a little bit more about this particular photograph? Um, not the image description, but if, if there's a story behind it or a process piece or something that you'd want the, the audience to know about with regard to this. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, for like a brief moment, I got, actually not brief, uh, for, for a moment, I got really interested in the way that tool, uh, especially in a black and white photograph, looks a lot like scar tissue. Um, and I was playing around with it in self-portraits, in installation work, in um, all kinds of different ways. And um, I'm actually still very interested in it, but <laughs> all of my tool is in big boxes in a storage unit right now. So <laughs> it's been on hold for a little bit, but um, I was, I had a little studio um, and I was taking these photos and I was just sort of playing around with what it felt like to be in this sort of mass of, for lack of a better word, scar tissue. Um, and I was thinking about the way that I have like this very visible piece of scar tissue that's inside one of my eyeballs um, and that you can totally see like without any special equipment. Um, there's just like a white streak going through my eye. And I was thinking about that and about the way that connective tissues um, are really fibrous and are really um, prone to breakage in people with connective tissue disorders, which I have. And so I was thinking about all those things and I <laughs> was in grad school at the time and I took this photo and I printed it out really big and I hung it in my studio and I got like five questions about whether or not I was at like a wedding dress um and about how like a bunch of critiques about how I couldn't be making art with tool because from a feminist lens it was only ever going to be about weddings and so I stopped making art with tool for a while <laughs> until I was done with grad school <laughs> um, but that's the idea behind that photograph yeah wow thank you and maybe we can stop screen sharing. Um, yeah, so we can have Aurora's presence in, um, as well. I'm, I'm curious, um, sorry, the tool is in storage, but I trust it'll come out of the back. Um, the, the theme, and this is just a sort of, not an artistic piece, but I'm curious if for any particular reason this matched the masked theme for you um, or how it relates to the theme of hidden and other things, if you want to elaborate on that at all. Some artists yeah. just shared their work and it, you know, in hindsight, some of the themes and the meaning comes later. I think, you know, there's these evolving understandings, but I'm just curious um, from your perspective, if there was a particular link to the masked theme. And if you want to say anything more about the theme and, you know, invisible and what's hidden around disability, potentially. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's actually, um, it's one of those photographs, and I guess this is true of a lot of my photographs, where I take an Im a picture and I know that it resonates with me for some reason, but I don't know what that full like resonance is yet. Um, and I think you're both photographers to some degree sitting in this call. So <laughs> this is probably like a very normal experience for people on this call. But I take, um, a lot of times I'll take a photo and I'm like, I there's something about this picture that makes sense uh, and I don't know what it is. And for this photograph in particular, it wasn't until after the whole like wedding dress debacle and then I moved back to Vermont and I was like, you know, living in a tiny apartment, a tiny room literally in like my parents' house and like trying to deal with my life. And I started realizing all of the layers that like that picture had for me. Um, and there's absolutely a lot about, you know, masking who I am as a person. Um, kind of ironic that I'm doing this in my classroom where I am very openly a queer uh, person, but I am not very openly a disabled person. Um, I've gone through a lot with the school district in terms of like what it means to be accessible to disabled people and they were not very open to it so I um, have not been very openly disabled here and um, 
on the other hand, I'm extremely openly gay and I have my uh, pray the gay to stay mug on my desk and things like that. And my pride flag that is getting hung up over a whiteboard over there. Um, <laughs> and so I find that to be really interesting because in grad school, I was really openly disabled and I wasn't super openly queer. I never really made a point about being you know, queer. And I never like said like, oh no, I'm straight. Like I'm, but it never, I just never came up. Um, it would only come up when people would be like, so like, why don't you have a boyfriend? And I'd be like, why, why would I? Um, <laughs> um, but it never came up. And so the fact that the wedding dress thing was what kept coming up was like the first time that I had to like actively say to my professors, like, it's not about that because like, I'm gay and that's just not part of my life. Like the heterosexual weird white dress narrative is just not there in my work. And like, if you're reading into it, that's your interpretation, but it's not, a, it's a self portrait. So that's not what it's about. Um, and so uh, I think, yeah, the, the piece has come to have a lot of layers. And then one of the other things that really I really loved about the tool is that it's both visible and not. And um, as an invisibly disabled person, um, that's, you know, my life. Um, and having a connective tissue disorder is really about like trying to figure out what your limits are while like the rest of the world's like, you're fine. I don't know why you're saying you can't do that. Like everybody else has to do it. Why are you just like trying to get out of doing things? So um, it also certainly has that layer as well. And it probably has other layers that I will figure out at some other point in time. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the word layers, especially with the tool and the wrapped in the, the, in the tangles. And I'm moving my hands around my head right now, probably not so coordinatedly, but perfectly right for me, right? Um, and the, the way, what I'm thinking about now is the way you were talking about how the tool reminded you of scar tissue. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, um, art has a life of its own in some ways. There's sort of where the artist comes from and the expression, and then there's how people receive it and that dialogue back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so how the, the wedding dress interpretation has brought more layers and exploration for you as an artist. Um, yeah, and, and the more layers that will, will follow. Um, yeah. Side note on this piece, um, it's one of the, so one of the access features for masked, is it okay to do a side note? Maybe it'll be interesting. I don't know, I hope. <laughs> um, but one of the access features for masked is that we have um, something called tactile rep representations and then tactile elements to engage with the art. And so the representations are actually done by the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And they are representations of the, the lines and the, some of the textures and shadows within the images and they're there's a printer that they have and we work with them to do that. Um, this piece wasn't done with a tactile representation, um, but there's a tactile element. So we have tool that we've brought to the exhibition sites so that people can actually touch the tool and engage with it. And um, I don't know that I understood the connection to scar tissue if I'm just picking that up now, but it'll be an interesting thing to be able to share with students as or participants as they touch the the tool and have that sensory engagement with this very visual piece of art that you know brings up more sensors so um if any stories come i'll share them pass them back if you i love yeah. that <laughs> yeah um i'm curious you know so so the masking the visible the invisible disabilities disability identity you know one of the things um you know i read the chapter that you shared and i'm not going to get the exact title right um, I don't even know what it is. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so for the, the audience, um, Aurora, maybe tell about the chapter so that even if we don't have the exact sure. title, we have the context, <laughs> please. Yes. So, um, I recently wrote a chapter of a book, um, and I guess I could be, you know, very professional and know the title of something that I've written, which <laughs> would require a lot more energy than I'm, I'm uh, ever have. Um, maybe. Maybe Magic but, Man is going to find it. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh, right. Okay. So the book is called Redefining Disability. Um, it came out earlier this year from Brill Press. It is 
very expensive, which is unfortunate. Um, but I wrote a chapter for it. It is called Disability Aesthetics, a Crip Artistry Manifesto. Um, and I really enjoyed writing it. I really enjoyed getting to have sort of an academic chance to think about what disability aesthetics means to me and in a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So maybe, um, would you mind sharing, Aurora, um, what disability aesthetic means and how it, I mean, this is a long conversation, but you know, how it connects to your art and your process and some of what I've um, you know, made notes about to ask you to connect with you about um, come from what I read and you know, how I responded to that beautiful piece of writing, so. Yeah, definitely. So um, to me, Disability aesthetics, um, I, I mean, it's, it's a varied field, right? But it, an aesthetic is like the, um, bear with me because it is now like 5 p.m. on a day that I've been <laughs> pretty and much just drunk coffee about. and eaten nothing. <laughs> but um, basically it's, it's ideas that are concerned with like beauty and the principles that are around beauty. Um, and so, a, aesthetics of disability is really considering where disability falls within the ideas of beauty and within the ideas of art and the ideas of artist um, artistry and how we create art. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of varied ways of looking at that between, you know, disabled artists making art and then art about disabled people made by able-bodied artists. Um, and just the way, even if you just think about like the way that we represent disabled people in popular culture, um, those are all like building blocks that form what sort of our social and cultural understanding of a disability aesthetic is. Yeah. And there were so many things in that that, I, that I'm gonna sit with and reflect upon, but a couple of them come out um that I want to just bring to your attention and it is um after a work day five o'clock so <laughs> you're not going to be tested I you know let's have this air of imperfection <laughs> like we're humans um and uh if that works for you um Absolutely. <laughs> and and one of the things you talked about this was like top on my list imperfection <laughs> you know like this idea of I don't know if it's a disability aesthetic or framework um or you know that that imperfection is, you know, part of the human experience. So maybe if you want to speak to that um, as it relates to your art, as it relates to your process, um, as it relates to anything that makes sense to you five o'clock on a random Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, imperfection is, is a, I think it's a huge part of disability aesthetics. Honestly, um, I think it's a big part of when we think about disability um, we think of imperfect. Um, and I think that when you're trying to unpack something like aesthetics, you have to get into this idea of, well, a cultural understanding of aesthetic is really just what do we think of when we think of beauty? What do we think of when we think of ugly? Um, that's actually like our cultural understanding of aesthetic because we all are part of that larger social cultural experience. So if like you, as you sit here thinking about this, just go like, well, what does beauty mean to me? Like that's, that is aesthetics for you. And so for us as like a communal culture, thinking about imperfection is really um, important because we think about disabled people as incomplete or broken in some way. Um, just like sort of at a fundamental level where like, okay, well, you're disabled means you there's something that's not working. Um, and so when you're thinking about that from an art perspective, a lot of times it comes down to what are those imperfections in the art? So like whether it's um, some like very old art, I mean, very old being like a hundred years when I say that, but like Otto Dix, like, you know, painting his like disabled war veterans and he's like, okay, well, this one's got, you know, a peg leg and this one's like visibly shaking. Those are like showing those imperfections. When you're thinking about something as visual as art, um, or especially 2D art, which is you know the majority of of Western art anyway, um, 
you're really thinking about how to visually see something that is intangible is not necessarily visual it might be invisible like disability and so a lot of times the way that we show that is through imperfection um and as an artist the way that i've come up with um that has best worked for me is to embrace those imperfections in my art and that let those imperfections be part of the like visual language that signals that the work is about disability in some way. So um, I do a lot of work that has kind of like wonky focus um, where maybe the thing that should be in focus isn't quite in focus and that's okay. Um, I do a lot of work with cyanotype and cyanotype is by nature imperfect. Um, I actually think perfect cyanotypes are kind of boring. <laughs> um, I really like when there's something really bizarre going on with like a streak that you just didn't know was there until you expose the image. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of my interest in photography comes from those imperfections and not the like perfectly posed, perfectly lit photograph. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we want to show some, there's a sienna type image um, there's, that was in the slide deck that we had in terms of preparation. Um, if this is an okay time to do that. Um, yeah. And I think, I think it's called clouded. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, perfect. So this cyanotype, um, it is called clouded. <laughs> um, I will do a quick visual description. It's a piece of paper. Um, this is actually a pretty large one. This is 24 by 32, I want to say. Um, and it is like this deep indigo blue, um, the entire image, which is sort of the visual sim signal of a cyanotype. And it's a photograph of my eyeball. It's actually a macro photo. And it's of the eyeball that I was talking about earlier that has a stripe of scar tissue in it. Um, and you can see all of the like blood vessels in my eye. And you can see this little white stripe going through my eye and some little reflections of the of my light boxes. And um, <laughs> you can see this like, it looks like glitter around my eye, but I. I'm pretty sure it's just like eyeshadow from like 10 hours earlier <laughs> that I just transferred. <laughs> um, but just like I was talking about with the imperfections, you can mm -hmm. see these brush strokes that are kind of right where my eyebrow should be. Um, so it kind of makes sense. It looks like you're looking at an eyebrow. Um, but there's this streakiness where the white from the paper is showing through. Um, and there's also like very rough edges to the image, um, where I did not coat the cyanotype paper correctly. And I would love to say that I like achieved that on purpose. Cause I'm like really good at making edgy looking photographs, but the reality is that I am visually impaired and I'm working in a dark room <laughs> with an <laughs> invisible medium. So the reality is I just am bad at coating cyanotype paper <laughs> and I really like the way that that looks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the description as well. Um, and one of the things you were commenting on um, with regard to cyanotype was that there's sort of this chance and happenstance about the process itself, which is very much um, what, what I heard and what you were, what I read was, um, so if I'm not getting this accurate, please correct me, but it's just part of the disability kind of skill set or knowledge is to let, let control go or let be some things and just see what happens with the chance and happenstance, which is inherent in the, the process with cyanotypes. Is that accurate? Yeah. So that's, um, that's totally right. Um, the thing with cyanotype, um, as I was saying, you know, you are coding in a dark room or in my case, like literally just my dark bedroom with like a tarp on the floor and kind of like praying that you don't get cyanotype all over the floor, which I did badly. And now there's blue spots on my floor. <laughs> um, but you're also, when you expose the image, you have to sort of allow for some just chance in the image making process. Um, for one thing, like it's, it's kind of like mono printing, right? Like you can't replicate a cyanotype exactly. 
um, they just never come out exactly the same. Even if you have the same, um, if you have the same perfectly coded paper and the same negative that hasn't been exposed, like maybe you double printed your negative and you leave it out in the sun and there's no clouds for like 30 minutes, like there's just, it's almost impossible to completely replicate an image. And so you have to just sort of take into account that clouds will come across the sky or, you know, your image will have gotten kind of fried the last time you did and you're not going to go reprint your negative or there'll be some brush strokes that just sort of, you didn't notice that they were there, but they've appeared and um, maybe you overexpose it or you underexpose it because you didn't take into account the clouds. And so it really is about letting some of that control go and seeing what happens. And my favorite cyanotypes that I've ever made have all had some form of imperfection to them of just like, they came out of the water bath and I was like, oh, that wasn't what I was trying to do. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I was just thinking about sometimes too, that there, you were talking about the photograph, the fibrosis covered in tool, how mm -hmm. there was a resonance, but you, you know, there wasn't maybe a why or a, a clear way to articulate what um what the feeling was but it's kind yeah. of layered and involved and it sounds like the cyanotype that process and the chance and they're like I really like that is <laughs> is part of the part of the the fun maybe even <laughs> it definitely is because if it was just a matter of putting two images together in photoshop like I could do that um I could put any of my photos into photoshop and turn them blue but that's just like not what the cyanotype experience gives you and cyanotyping is like so much more frustrating and so much more work but the results are so much more interesting yeah as an artist you seem you know and I probably read this so um it's not me being wiser insightful but just <laughs> that you focus on process that the the products you know are not where you focus your time and attention and with the weave of imperfection and some of these other um you know, disability identity, aesthetic, those frameworks, that there's one part where you were describing that you were tearing photographs, you know, as part of the process. And I, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about that um, and how it emerged and, you know, how you find meaning in it. Um, yes. Um, so for one thing, um, making art for me has never been so much about like a product that I could I don't know, sell um, or show uh, for that matter, especially since I live in Vermont where there aren't very many opportunities to become a blue chip gallery, you know, artist. Um, it's always been much more about just the process of making art. And so because I'm a photographer, that means it's about being out in the woods with my camera or it's about being in a studio with my camera and just being in that experience. Or like more recently, I've been getting into watercolor for some apparent reason. And um, that's about just like the experience of putting water and paint onto paper and like working it and seeing what develops and what I feel like I need. Um, so it's very therapeutic. The thing with the tearing the photographs um, originally came from, um, I used to work in a print lab with large scale printers and my professor that ran the print lab was like, whenever you have like a huge print that just took 20 minutes to run and it cost you like $5 and it came out wrong, you have to tear it up because that is the only cathartic thing you can do with that <laughs> print. And so I like just started tearing up photos. Um, I'd be like, well, that was a waste of $5. Really glad that I just spent the last 45 minutes wasting five dollars <laughs> that was a great way to spend my night uh let me spend another five dollars and hope this time it works um but I started tearing up all these prints from my undergrad thesis show that were my like trashed prints and I sort of had like thrown them all on the floor and then I looked down and I was like actually I really like that <laughs> so I picked up all my pieces and like put them back in my portfolio <laughs> Um, and that is where tearing all of my art up came from. <laughs> and then for a while, it all just like lived on my studio floor in grad school. And people would be like, I don't want to come in your studio. I don't want to like step on your photos. And I was like, no, they're literally there to be stepped on. <laughs> 
um, but people found that very uncomfortable. So it was kind of handy. It kept people out of my studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that makes me think of social conditioning and social sort of ways that what we value and how we think we should be, even when we're told something maybe different, like try it out, yeah. step on the photos, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, step on the photos <laughs> of my naked body. It's fine. <laughs> Oh, right. The detail of the naked body. Is, right. The is naked the body. That I didn't get into just right. now. <laughs> They're usually photos of my naked body. <laughs> so it makes it even more awkward for people. It's great. <laughs> Pushing the edges, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's what grad school's for. Yeah. And, and look, um, it might be obvious to the audience that we sort of agreed to just see where the conversation takes us. That reminds me about sort of the subjects of your art and, you know, the um, naked body, but body. And, you know, so maybe if you wanted to share a little bit more with the audience about kind of what inspires you and what you, yeah. what you make, it's self-expression, self-portraits. I think I, yeah. I read expansive self-portraits. So a little bit more about that, but then, you know, kind of visually, um, and maybe we can at some point after that description, bring up another image or two to share. Um, yeah. So yeah, expansive self-portraits is definitely a line I've used. Um, yes, I would categorize all of my work as self-portraiture, although a lot of it is not photographs of me. Um, it's all photographs of things that make me who I am. Mm -hmm. So there's a series uh, called Homestead that are photographs from the house that I was born in. Um, there is a series about um, like farming in rural Vermont, which is about the place I grew up. Um, and there are quite a few series of photo of self portraits that are more traditional self portraits. So they're photographs of me, uh, largely naked, trying to take more clothed photos now that I teach in a public school because I need those. <laughs> unclothed ones to maybe not be the ones that public are seeing anymore uh, at the moment at least. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, they are, they're self-portraits and they're often different ways of thinking about the body in space mm -hmm. and specifically my body in space. Great. Um, I say great, like I have to have a response. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm with you. That's what it really means. I'm going to translate that. Like I'm hearing you, I'm engaged and I'm super interested. And one of the other things that I um, will share a couple images in just a minute, a couple more. Um, and when we go live, we'll post where people can find more of your work, your Instagram mm -hmm. and all of that, because that's part of what we want to um, make available um, for, for folks. But the um, internalized ableism that was i mean so here's a complete you know my bias as a disabled artist as well like part of what my art initially helped me explore first with myself and then with others was the the biases that i had about my own being and body and productivity and value essentially so when you talk about self portraiture and what has meaning to you i can relate in some ways even though we're very different humans, you know, um, but how the art kind of takes a person or can take a person on a journey. And I wonder if you want to talk any more, if you'd be open to talking any more about the internalized ableism um, and part of how, and, and maybe, and maybe I'm making this up, but if self-portraiture has been part of that journey of um, exploring ableism within you. It definitely has. Um, that was actually where it started um was right around the time that I started identifying as disabled was the same time that I started taking self-portraits um in sort of the more intensive way that I do now um it was very much about examining who I was and who I had like who I existed as and what my body was capable of and what my body was not capable of. And that has been really um, a really good source of understanding for me what my body can and can't do through photographs, whether it's through like the physical taking of the photograph or the like process of 
editing and like really experiencing like what what is this photograph that I'm like working on um like it's a photograph of me and I'm like understanding it from sort of a different viewpoint than being inside of it um and even just the experience of being like oh uh turns out this is much harder for me to hike into the woods with my camera than it used to be that is a good note to have <laughs> I should not do this, um, which is one of those, you know, self limitations that sucks when you suddenly realize that you have a limitation that you didn't used to have. Um, but it also, you know, is the source of discovering that. So I guess in some way it's cool. Yeah, thank you for sharing a little bit more about that. I think ableism is one of those, again, this is my opinion. Do you mind if I share? No, please do. I think it's a a scary word or it can be something that we sort of push against because we don't want to have the isms inside of us even though we do and to really look closely at um oneself and uh I sometimes tell the story of I was in Staples during the early pandemic as a social outing errand thing and there was this folder I might have said this before to you so <laughs> but it says I literally can't and it's glittered and fuchsia and fuchsia is not my color but I have this folder and I've taken pictures because it to be able to say in an empowered place I can't and not have it linked to self-worth is is kind of it's a moment you know like for me captured in this folder that you know I use glitter on a lot of things but um so it just yeah and I think that you know part of what I hope these talks can do is um communicate with folks that um, you know, people with and without disabilities, that this ableism is kind of in us and there's a way to get through it. And on, you know, the process is part of the journey as well, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, I love that. I feel like I need a fuchsia glitter, literally can't. <laughs> <folder. laughs> I think it might fit my, it's my vibe <laughs> slightly better. But, um. Yeah. And, you know, it's it, all these messages, right? You know, you're in education settings and academia and all these, the, the, sh the shoulds and odds are um, unrealistic and not always helpful, I think. So, absolutely. Um, I, <laughs> thanks for hearing my philosophy for a minute. Let's um, maybe bring up some more of your images. And um, is that? Yeah, let's do yeah. it. Megan. <laughs> there you go. So this is a photograph. Um, I believe this one's called cleft uh and I think it's called like three months in the forest or something like that um this is uh an example of my self-portraiture that is sort of re-contextualizing what it means to be a body in space so this photograph is of a piece of cloth that's been nailed to a wall um and it's very dirty <laughs> and it's got a black and white photograph of my like decolletage on it um that's like mostly just like my clavicle <laughs> and um my neck and so my neck is sort of like twisted to the side and it's got very dramatic lighting so it has very harsh shadows on it um but it's really just like a very prominent photograph of my clavicle <laughs> um, and this photograph has been printed on fabric and then left in the woods uh, near my childhood and current home for three months. Um, I it, It's part of a project that I did uh, four years ago now, I guess, um, that was a really big part of my graduate thesis. And basically, I had to come back to Vermont for three months um for eye surgery and then more eye surgery when the first one failed and I was sort of stuck in the middle of like what is supposed to be you know your like summer of getting all of your MFA work done they're like okay you've got five semesters and one of them's your summer vacation and you're like okay great and then I was like stuck in Vermont in a house with no electricity so I printed out all these photographs onto cotton and I brought them home with me and I put them in the woods all around my house in this place where I like learned how to walk and exist and be in my body. Um, and I left them there for three months and I just kind of went back and visited them. And I'm not sure which the other image is in this set, but it might also be from that. Um, and it was a really interesting experience putting 
these sort of replicas of my body or like stand-ins for my body in a place and just letting them decay and like letting bugs eat them and whatever happened happened and just sort of again letting go of some of that control um letting go of like my ability to make aesthetic decisions anymore it was really about letting chance happen and letting whatever you know life threw at it happen and I went back and visited the photos over time and I took re-photographed them and they're on my website under a category called restoration um and then when I went back to LA I displayed some of the cotton pieces like this that just nailed to a wall but it was very much a experience of like being in a space um and thinking about what that space was for me mm. and then Megan if you want to go to the other one yeah okay I thought this might be the other one <laughs> um so this photograph is also from the restoration series um this is called bleeding out which is in reference to the trees and not myself um but it's a photograph um of another one of these cotton photographs this one is quite large uh, I'm gonna say like three by four feet maybe mm -hmm. and it is nailed to two trees um that are sort of standing parallel to each other um going through the right half of the photograph left half of the photograph again you'd think I can't teach art based on my inability to tell right and left part um and they're in this just like very summery green Vermont forest um and then the places where the nails have been tapped into the trees there's this sort of like brownish it looks like the trees are bleeding it's like sap dripping down the sides of the photograph um and it didn't happen on any of the other photos I put out it was just this one um mm -hmm. I still don't really know what happened I don't really think it was sap I think it was like the rust from the nails but it didn't happen on any other ones I have no idea it was bizarre and really cool um the photograph is of me it's of my back and I'm sort of sitting like all curled up in the fetal position um you can see like the top of my head um and mostly like my spine and my hands gripping my shoulders mm -hmm. and yeah this is one of those sort of in situ moments of being in the woods re-experiencing this you know nature reclaiming me thing it's very lovely I also couldn't see anything while I was taking the photos because I had just had eye surgery. So it's like, I hope this comes out well. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of chance, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's yeah. What our focus is for. Yeah, and, and then later, you know, deleting. If mm -hmm. you, Yeah, at least that's my experience, so. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I think that the, that process focus that, there's a timelessness and a joy and there, you know, like there's a, a feeling of being in a process that's really different than having an expectation of an outcome. And that surprise that can come with like what you were saying is it didn't happen to the other photos that were nailed to, to trees, but look here and you know, what can this offer? Um, yeah, definitely. And there were a lot of pictures I put up, I think, I think I put 17 of them up um in like various places in the woods and none of them like had the same results some of them like I had immersed two of them in water and the way that like this the dirt in the water and like the rocks like completely different um I had a ton of them nailed to trees this is the only one that that happened to so it's really fascinating to see the way that like the different images some of them like basically looked like I hadn't done anything they just like still looked like they were like commercial processed photos and some of them you were like that probably did not come off of a printer <laughs> uh, the the poet in me wonders about you know how that's very similar to people you know hanging on trees in the woods which fantasy for me like I love the trees in the woods but how we're all different and we have different experiences even in yeah. similar yeah um, Aurora, we're we're kind of getting to it. I mean, I could talk for much longer, 
Um, but we're getting near the end. I'm curious if there's um, anything about your art. So what does art mean to you that if you had to, I mean, I'm not going to say one word, which is sometimes what I do, because that seems silly. But to sort of consider what does art mean, you know, for Aurora Burger today in this moment? Um, I think for me, um, art is about, I think that art is a tool for processing and that's true for people looking at it and for people making it. Um, and I think that sometimes that processing is about the making of things and like just putting feelings onto paper or even just ignoring feelings by putting things on paper while you like squish down the other feelings that you're ignoring. Um, but it's still processing, even if you're trying not to process. And then for other people, it's about looking at art and finding pieces of yourself that you didn't know you needed to work on. And I think really all of our understanding of art comes down to that. It's just about figuring out what it is that we need and finding a way to get that. Thank you. And that, that bridging, the connection between inner and outer artist and um, viewer, connector, that there's a way that it connects um, through a process of creativity, I think for me. Yeah. Once it's created, it sort of has a life of its own and multiple lives and layers and, you know, all of those things. Yeah, it definitely um, does. And I know I see that. Um, I didn't really even say this at the beginning, but like I teach K through eight art, which is hence this silly thing behind me um, <laughs> and the silly classroom I'm sitting in full of rainbows. But that's what I see every day in art class, mm -hmm. right? Is like these kids come in and they find something in themselves and maybe that something is that they just like really need to roll around on the floor <laughs> and it's not what I have planned but they find something <laughs> yeah. it's so interesting I was just going to ask about sort of you know Aurora as an artist and writer photographer writer and then also educator and you know your writing and your art seem to be educating and you're also a teacher so you just sort of intuitively went to that <laughs> For me, and I pass it on and I notice it in others and I can create a space where people can, youth, kids can create and find their own processes. Um, yeah. Probably outside the bounds too. Like rolling on the floor may not be suitable in every <laughs> single classroom, but maybe it's just that creative process. Yeah. Or the itchy foot or whatever. I don't know. Exactly. And sometimes it's just like, okay, clearly you just really need more recess and this is not recess. You need to do something <laughs> else right now. Make a different choice, please. But I see that like clearly you need to be out of your chair and moving. It's not the best place for you to be doing it, unfortunately. <laughs> But, you know, like this, I, my philosophy when it comes to like art education is really that like, this is a place for kids to have their own studio. Maybe they have a studio at home with tons of supplies and they get to make whatever they would like to make whenever they would like to make it. And maybe they have no art supplies at all at home. And so I don't want those kids with no art supplies at home to not get the opportunity to play around with and experiment and make mistakes. and make messes just because they don't have that opportunity in their household. Um, mm -hmm. And so while we do plenty of, you know, projects that are, you know, you need to actually sit and listen to directions, there's also a lot of opportunity for play and experimentation and um, choice and um, making those, making the art that they would like to make and making that count. Um, and I think it has been really successful with kids that people would be like, I, you know, they hate art and then they come into the art room and they have a great time because they're able to choose what they would like to be doing. And they are engaged because they made the choice. Um, and that's been really lovely. Yeah. 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 Um, I have this big smile on my face. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Aurora. Before we wrap up, we want to invite Megan back in. And Megan, um, thank you for being with us um, behind the scenes. Is there anything you want to add to the conversation questions before we say bye for now and um, take this live in a, in a couple of weeks? 
I just want to share my thanks for being here. I'm a big fan of Aurora's art, and it's always wonderful to get to listen to Aurora speak about it. And just um, something that really resonated for me was um, the whole idea of like critiquing perfectionism and embracing imperfections or the idea of imperfections as beautiful through art. So thank you for sharing that. Of course. I also love talking to both of you. Um, it's been a while. Well, not that long. <laughs> I was going to, I think this is the first time I've done an inclusive arts Vermont talk, not in some weird public place. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we appreciate your perspective and your time and your care. And um, if you want to give a shout out to where people can find you on this, um, so it'll go on the YouTube place, we can do that. And, sure. and then we can, um, it'll be live as well. But these are all the logistics that I want to make sure get covered, but they're not necessarily first on my list. So <laughs> That's fair. Um, they're clearly not even on my list because I forgot to tell people who I, what I actually do or like where to find me, but um, I am on the interwebs, um, auroraburger.com, pretty easy. Um, I'm also on Instagram at auroraburger as long as I can manage to pull off being a public school teacher with nudes on their Instagram account. And uh, so follow me before I have to go private. <laughs> and um <laughs> I'm also on Twitter, but I don't think I've used that account in a very long time. So follow me there and look at my silence. Um, I also have a bunch of writing on my website and I will gladly send people the chapter about disability aesthetics if they would like to read it. However, I cannot post it publicly on my website because that is copyright infringement, but I have a PDF of it and you may have it if you would like, so. <laughs> Uh, shoot me an email if you would like to read that. And that, I think, is all of my links. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, wishing you the best, and we'll be in touch very soon. Yay! Thanks, everybody, I for being with us tonight.